All right, good. Welcome, everybody. Um, so last week, I was asked to talk a little bit about publish the publishing process and authorships. And so I was pondering what I want to give you in sort of a 35 minute run up. Um, and this is what I actually want to do. All right. So at first, I want to talk about the publication process. And of course, a question that I often get, what is actually publishable? And that's actually a tricky question, and we'll dive into that as the first point. Um, then we're going to do a run up from public, therefore, the publication from start to finish to celebrating that you actually have your first or second or third paper published. Um, and then I want to hit briefly a short point, which is preprint publications. Uh, because that's something that's sort of a hot topic. And then as a second part, I want to quickly hit the authorships. And I think that is uh, very important because that can um, lead to disputes. So we're going to hit what is an author and what his responsibilities are. Um, and then we're going to look into how disputes on the authorship level are actually solved. Before we actually go to the publication, I actually want to hit something that's really dear, uh, hopefully, to all of us. And this is what we actually, why I became a scientist, and that is because I want to generate scientific knowledge. And that means I want to extend the knowledge we have beyond what is already known. And if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that, there's actually a great book on that called On Being a Scientist. Uh, published by the National uh, Academy of Science in the U.S., and it's sort of a guide for a responsible conduct of research. When you look in that book, a little bit further down, scientific knowledge does not stop with me knowing a cool answer to a biological question. Um, it's actually more than that. And what it basically states is that the it uh, becomes scientific knowledge or science when the individual knowledge, what I know and you know, is actually presented to others and can be independently judged for its validity. And we talked a little bit about that in the last talk and also before, um, that we need to be really sure that our data is valid and the forum that we present our data is, of course, at conferences, uh, we're really enthusiastic about going to those, but the thing is nobody will remember exactly what was shown during your talk um, months, years later, and that's why it's important to really publish, have it in a written form, and that's sort of our starting point for today. The big question is coming to what is publishable in the next step is really who wants to know or who is the audience and who will uh, want to know what we know? And there are, of course, two entities. On the one hand, that's the reader. And on the other hand, of course, the journals uh, who are in the business of you know, providing the platform. And so what is publishable is actually decided by those two entities, meaning the journal that selects paper that are open optimally widely read and useful to their particular readership. Um, readership. Um, which means that this actually differs quite a bit between, for example, a journal like Nature to a journal that, like Journal of Virology, the top virology journal. Um, of course, the audience there is quite different and the expectation of that audience is also different. So whenever you ask yourself what is publishable, um, Maybe ask the other question first, where is it publishable? Of course, when you want to publish something in a high-end journal, um, you, your story has to be more round, has to be more, provide more to really fulfill this criteria and the following three. Um, if you just want to, if your story is not uh, following the guidelines or the, the criteria we're going to look at in a minute, then of course you can go down the ladder um, till you have a journal that has no impact or very little impact, hardly anybody reads that. And of course, a very small or very non-comprehensive story can be published there, but on the other hand, that is not helping you as a scientist at all. You just 
you know, you have a publication, but that doesn't count if it's in a non-impact journal, right? Okay, so let's look at what actually journals are looking for. Um, of course, they want not just the journals, but also the leaders. They want original and significant findings, and they should be cover a broad spectrum of readers. And you know that is how your research gets cited, right? You want to have a broad audience and a lot of people that think that this is pretty cool. I'm going to build my research on that and I'm going to cite exactly your research. And then, of course, we all, when, whenever you read a paper, worst case is it's not well organized and not well written, right? So you want to have a well written paper with clear statements, it's easy to follow, and that you really, after the day, after or after reading uh, that paper, you're there and you say, okay, cool, I've learned really something new. Uh, and this is, you know, something I, I want to use, or I, I, I built that into my puzzle of uh, biological research. And then, of course, uh, papers should be concise yet complete. So you don't want to blab for 50 pages. Nobody wants to read that. Uh, but, you know, the art is to be concise and still have everything that matters in there. So, and that points towards that, you know, doing the best experiment to answer the right question um, is sort of the goal that we're already thinking about um, when we design our research uh, projects and um, also which experiments will be done. Otherwise, I will go to the next step, which means, you know, we have uh, talked that journals, journals are of course different and an important choice that you have to make before um, or should maybe eyeball where your data could actually go is, is choosing a journal. And I just want to quickly hit that because that's often not 100% not clear how you choose a journal. And of course, you can go the tedious way of looking for similar manuscripts have been published. Uh, you can go on the website of the particular journal. Uh, you look through the instructions for the authors, which you should do in any case, whenever you write a paper, that's the first thing you do, you look for the instructions for the authors. Uh, then you look for the mission statements, they usually state their audience, and you can look through the issues, right? And then you have a better idea whether that is a journal you want to publish. It. You can also use directories and websites like Web of Science, and they have lists of, you can click, you want a virology or immunology, and it's going to give you a list of journals with their impact factors and other metrics. And so metrics are probably a strong factor that basically influences um, what you, or which journal you're going to go for. And of course, the easy way out is always talk to your advisor he usually has been in the field for a while and knows his way around. Um, so you can talk to him and get sort of feedback. Maybe you do a list of the top two or three journals that you want to go for, and then you go for it. Of course, other factors like open access uh, that is becoming more and more important. And I think we as a scientific community, we really have to push for open access. Um, of course, you know, the system that Elsevier and other journal uh, journals or companies have built, it's pretty much to just take as much money out of research as possible. Um, of course, acceptance rate, Nature might be have a 95% rejection rate, other journals have a much lower rejection rate, so that might influence your decision. And also the time, some journals are rather fast, others take ages to actually, you know, send the reviews out and, and get things done. Good. Let's do a quick run on preparing your manuscript. I mean, if you are interested, of course, you know, how to write a scientific paper, that's a complete own course and will take a lot of time. So this is just a quick run up on how to prepare your manuscript. Of course, you optimally choose your journal first. Uh, that will be the best way because then you can look through the instructions to the office for your specific journal and then you know how that should be, meaning how you should format it, how the manuscript is organized, how the structure is, how the citation style for the literature is, uh, how your figures should be, illustrations and so forth. 
Um, and I think that's very important because you don't want to redo everything a million times. So, um, and the thing is, if you submit something that does not fit uh, the guidelines, there is a chance that, you know, the editor says, you know, if you don't have time to format your paper to our guidelines, then I don't have the time to actually look at it. Um, that's something to consider. Of course, use EndNote or any other reference manager. Uh, this is crucial because you might submit your paper to more than one journal. With that, you can then just switch the reference style uh, to match the journal guidelines here. And as you heard in the last talk, avoid duplications um, and, um, you know, even from your own manuscripts. I mean, you know, there are elegant ways to get around that, for example, citing your previous paper and keeping that part of the material methods rather short um, and say you already described that uh, in your previous manuscript. Then submitting the manuscript. Nowadays, that's everything electronic. So you go on the journal website, you fill out the information that takes quite some time, actually more than just the authors and potential reviewers that you want, would like to have or would like to exclude. Um, you submit your electronic version of the manuscript um, and you know make sure your figures are right, they're high resolution, for example, TIFF. In the end, you get a PDF that's being made and uh, you can look through it, see whether everything looks good, figures look good. Um, and then you press the submit button and you get your acknowledgement email that you know uh, it's done. And then of course, after that comes that black box and, and you know, a lot of people have their own vision of how that black box looks like. Uh, one vision uh, could be this, right? Um, that, you know, you are the scientists, uh, you know, I have a little more hair than that right now, but that might change over time. Um, and then in the end, uh, you want to have your paper accepted. Um, but there is still the editor in the way and a bunch of reviewers that are sitting there with a chainsaw or an ax that just want to, you know, slap your, um, your manuscript, right, and your research. What I want you to take home that it's actually not like that, even though the impression might come across sometimes, this guy, the editor, that, that is actually somebody that intends to help and, you know, can be really helpful in the submission process. And also those reviewers, they're actually not bad people. Uh, they're, you know, they're doing their job and we'll briefly look at that, what that actually means. Uh, and it's important to look behind the scenes a little bit. Okay, so let's take a look uh, how what happens after you submit your uh, manuscript. So the editor gets the manuscript, and as uh, we said before, the manuscript might be rejected right out. And often those decisions don't take them really personal. It might be that just nature, science, and cell. Uh, looked at your field or looked at, you know, your question and decided that it's unlikely that we, that we'll get 30 citations. And it's not a fair game, of course, that of course favors areas that are heavily cited and a lot of people are working for, uh, working in. Uh, so don't take that personal, but when the editor decides, okay, this is something we want to give it a shot, it's usually on your side, he sends it to reviewers. Uh, at least two or three or more that can assess your manuscript. Then the reviewers send the reviews in, the editor makes a decision, either reject if there's no hope, uh, except with no revisions, that's really, really rare. So if you ever have that, uh, drop me an email and celebrate. And the alternative is that the author gets asked to make revisions and um, as a certain period of time, does it, sends it back, might go back to the reviewer, and then we're back um, at the decision step, whether it's going to fly or whether it's not. Coming back to our path to publication. So I think what is always important to actually look at uh, whenever you, whenever in life you're in a situation, try to be in somebody else's shoes. And so let's try to be briefly in that guy's, that guy's shoes 
with the bat and um, you know, let's take a look what 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 he's about. So the reviewer side is that the reviewer is usually an expert in the field. So like we all are, we are not bored, we're pretty busy. He actually does that voluntarily. So he doesn't get paid for that. He does that in his or her free time and might be on the couch uh, in the evening. Um, and of course, um, they only have a limited time on the six weeks is quite common. That means you have to somehow squeeze it into your work week or the weekend. Um, and of course, you have a ton of criteria that are different from journal to journal. There are just a few that you know the scope and novelty and significance, quality on the presentation and scientific side, as well as you have to address ethical issues. So there are a bunch of things you have to think about, um, and you're squeezing that in, and you're doing the best you can, or at least most reviewers do. And of course, their job is to find the weaknesses, and that's usually not a nice thing if you're if you love your research. If somebody finds a weakness, so let's move quickly to the reviewer side. When you basically get the manuscript for review, you get sort of instructions. They can be page long, um, can hit sort of the details and have score sheets and so forth. And when you're lucky, it's a simple format like this that you just have to say, accept minor revisions, major reject, uh, that you put in the comments to the editor and comments to the author. Nowadays, that list got longer and longer, whether that research has uh, dual use uh, problematics, whether the ethical things are correct. Um, you know, like you've heard uh, before, whether you spotted any, anything obvious. Um, so that list can be quite long, um, what the reviewer has to put in. So he presses the submit button that comes back to the editor, um, and the editor sends you um, back the comments. And then often, you know, especially when I was younger, I opened those and I felt like this, maybe not quite impressionistic like that, but um, often when you go deeper, you will find that it's actually not that dramatic. And um, we'll quickly to take a look at that um, as well. So let's look at the possible outcomes. So as we said, acceptance without revisions, rather rare. Acceptance with minor revisions, that's already a great thing. That means all the reviewers really liked it and didn't find all too much. What is quite common, major revisions. And that means that usually you need additional experiments. Um, and what you have to keep in mind, the, rev the editor will send it back to the reviewers, pretty sure, and optimally to the same reviewers, because then you, know, you directly approach them and solve the issues they have. And then, of course, the fourth option is reject. And that means then you have to reformat the paper and submit it to another journal. Um, but nowadays, that's quite common that actually the editor encourages you to resubmit it after extensive revisions. That is something, um, again, based on, on, on selective pressure on the journals, because they are judged by how long it takes from submission till acceptance. And a lot of the journals nowadays say, okay, if there's so much work, that period will be so long that we rather have uh, the author to uh, resubmit it as a new submission, and then your window is much, much shorter. So don't be discouraged. I mean, if the editor says, you know, please feel free to resubmit it after addressing the comments, you know, that is actually a good thing. That would have been a major revision in the past. All right. So, what do we want to? Where do you want to go with the revision of the manuscript? And I think the goal is always to be better. And if somebody, an expert in the field, has a suggestion, you know, think about it. Whether that makes your paper better, improves it, and in the end, you want to get it accepted. Um, and of course, if there are additional experiments required, really read what the reviewer wants. Right? It doesn't help to do any experiment or do, to, to do 10 experiments that do not perfectly address uh, the question he had. I mean, the goal in science is always to do the best experiment to answer the, the, the important question, in that case, of the reviewer. An important thing is that uh, your rebuttal letter. 
I think that is a key thing um, where you address point by point the comments of the reviewers. And the important thing is whose data, yeah, especially if you generated new data, facts and literature to support your points and don't get emotional, don't get you know, upset or cocky if you know, somebody stepped on your toes. Of course, what, what you really need to remember, the revised version and the rebuttal letter will likely go back to the reviewers. And if somebody spent their Saturday afternoon reviewing your paper and try to, you know, to give you your best input, getting back at them by being snotty and unfriendly is not going to fly because, you know, we all want to be treated fair. So carefully, um, Look at your choice of words and also the tone. Now, just give you one quick example how you can actually address it, and how actually a long comment that the reviewer might might write might be really just a little thing. So let's look at this paragraph. It's the reviewer starts into what he found, and in the end, Usually, when you look at a comment, you can distill out what he actually wanted, and I'll underline that briefly. Um, so the authors need to explain why they have blah blah blah. They have three sequences um, put in into into the genome overview, and a simple way to really make clear that okay, you got it um, is you say okay, you know the reviewer is right, and you know it's not an a, a hole. And that we did what he asked for, of course, it makes sense. And what is good if you also provide where you included that information, you know, you might get away that the reviewer just focuses on the key aspects, whether everything was done, you might read your comment or your response, and he would say, okay, well, he did it, looks at the lines, it's done, check mark, your paper is almost through, all right? Good. Um, and then, of course, you resubmit it, hopefully just once, and then your paper gets accepted. And I think the most important thing is to celebrate. Of course, if you cannot celebrate your victories, um, you know, there's less fun in science. So, you know, be, be happy, be proud. And I think that's the key of publishing something. You should not publish stuff you're not proud of. And, um, you know, celebrate and be proud of it. Um, another point that uh, to remember, the journal will send page proofs of your article. That means you will get a few weeks after it, or days after it got accepted, you're gonna get an email, go through, through your manuscript, last chance to correct typos, and you need to return that within a few days. That means, you know, don't, don't go on two months vacation and, uh, which you either do it in your vacation or you're not going to make that um, that deadline for the proofs. Then your article is almost out. Uh, you have um, usually comes out as electronic publication ahead before an issue comes out. Some journals don't have issues anymore. Uh, then you see it on the journal website and then shortly after it's on PubMed and you can celebrate again and be happy about it. So I want to quickly touch one thing, and that has been really pushed a lot, especially in also the context of coronavirus, uh, the coronavirus pandemic, and this are preprint publications. Um, and preprint publications, um, you can basically write your manuscript and upload it on a preprint server like BioRix, and then it's online. Everybody can see it. Everybody can see that you did it. You know, brought it out first, um, but you know this is not peer reviewed, and uh, that means you still have to go um, and make sure that your data is solid and reviewed, as we talked about um, on the science slide in the beginning by peer reviewers. So that's the process that we talked about. Just you submit your manuscript, you it gets reviewed, you correct it, and so forth, and it gets accepted. You're really happy. That's a time when you usually celebrate and pop the champagne. And then you have the copy editing and the typesetting and so forth, including the, the author's proofs. 
that we just talked about, and then it's published. And this is really what counts in the end. This is what we consider um, sort of the science, the addition of um, data after it was judged by, by peers in the end. Okay, so what are the advantages? You get your data out fast, and that proved to be valuable in the corona times, uh, especially, you know, you have to wait half a year, you don't know much. Um, you would get the first papers out you know, a lot later. Uh, you can get feedback. Uh, you can discuss that in a lot of the portals. You have feedback options that people can write and say something about your paper or give suggestions. And I think the most important or striking argument for preprints is that people see it and they can already think about it and also cite it, right? And if a preprint gets cited, uh, these citations can be transferred over to your um, publication. But there are also disadvantages and they're quite, you know, they're out there. Of course, some journals don't expect, accept uh, preprint manuscripts. Um, and of course, they're also, yeah, they're not peer reviewed, as we said. And the fear is that, you know, since people, if the preprint would be the norm, everybody could just upload anything. Um, bad science, wrong science, um, you know, and that's a little bit the fear uh, that people have uh, with preprint. And of course, the negative consequences. And as you've seen in the Corona times, I mean, uh, it, especially the press jumps onto those preprints and sells them as the truth and you know, in the end, when changes happen along the way, of course, more experiments were done, things can go and have negative consequences. So that's, I think, something to consider. All right, so take home message for the first part. Uh, the second part would be rather short. Um, so consider the impact of your data. So think about what journal it is. It's not necessarily about, is my data already publishable? Or where is it publishable at the current state? What would it take to actually improve the story, you know, to get it in a higher journal? And carefully select the, the optimal journal. Of course, you want to go as high as possible. Um, then pay attention to the germinal formatting and the guidelines and so forth. We talked about that, of course, you know, uh, if you can follow the rules, they're less inclined to give you a chance. Um, also remember the journal editor is a conduit for the review. I mean, you know, of course he can make a hard decision in the beginning, but the rest of the way he's guiding you it might not be the enemy and also th so are not the reviewers. Um, so be, be fair um, also when you respond. Uh, the review process ensures that only high quality papers are published. You know, also see sometimes negative examples that, that the system not always works, but I think for the most part it does. The preprints, they can increase your visibility. So that is, I think, the most striking point um, to do that extra step. And what I came across, you know, everybody is always afraid of the black box, but uh, in the end, the pathway of publishing a paper, you know, not always painful, but can also, you know, be illuminating and rewarding and show you things you haven't thought of and might uh, could, could really make your paper what's stronger. Um, yeah, and again, something to be proud of. All right, good. So authorships, um, there are authorship criteria, if you believe it or not, there are different ones, but uh, the one that is quite commonly used is from Resnick et al. And, um, Actually, this is the first one. So you need to substantially contribute uh, to the conception design of the work, acquisition, analysis, and interpretation of the data. But the key thing I think is that there is a big end, right? So this is itself not enough. So you need to be involved in working on, on drafting or revising the manuscript also in a critical way. And um, it doesn't stop there. Um, and you have to uh, approve of the final version to be published. And I think that sounds, um, you know, 
uh, easy, but this is something that must be done. So always send your final manuscript to your co-authors. Um, and then what is the most important, of course, that uh, foots on the comment, point number three, you're basically agreeing to be accountable in all aspects for the man for the publication, right? That means you're, uh, you know, you're responsible for the accuracy, integrity of of the work, and uh, also that things were done properly. Uh, that you don't have a scenario like before. So, again, also if it's your own paper, if you're, you know. Ask the questions if something doesn't sound right, and and you know get to the bottom of it. Because in the end, you as a co as an author, also a co-author, are responsible um, for these points. So you either take care of these four, or you're actually not really a proper author. Good. The NIH has a nice uh, visualization for that actually. So it goes by sort of what the contribution is, for example, design and interpretation of the results. Um, and again, it says basically yes or no, whether that's worth an authorship, right? And so if you provide a simple idea, that's you know, not quite it. But if it's, you know, provide the idea that gets the story or is the foot of the story, um, you know, that is a different story. And of course, you need an active involvement um, on the intellectual contribution. All right, so we just jumped on a few further to so supervise a role and I mean supervising the project, but you must be actively involved. And I think that's also a criteria of a good supervisor. You know, you need to be actively involved. Also, if you look at uh, support and resources, just providing money is not cutting it, right? And that's it's not a money based, it's a science based and knowledge based uh, criteria. Uh, if you provide resources or animals, you know, if things are published, usually it's a no. If it's really novel and, and essential to actually, you know, assess what, what you did, um, there can be a small yes. Same for, for patients as well. Also, data acquisition. So if you uh, did uh, original experiments of the work, that's a green guess. But at the same time, remember, they're four criteria and they have an end. So it's not enough to just provide the experimental work. You need to, you know, involve yourself in the other parts as well, right? Uh, if you do data analysis or statistical analysis, only if it's basic, it's a no. If you really contributed to get this work out, and the last point, writing. And so, you know, if you write the whole manuscript and it's really a decent draft, um, I think that this is the criteria of, of, you know, being eligible for a first authorship. And I, I totally agree that, um, you know, it's always hard to judge what is a good draft, um, but, you know, being involved in the writing process as on the last slide is a really key aspect as well. Um, also, of course, you're responsible for what's written in it. So if you don't have a say in it or no influence, um, it's not cutting it. All right, by reading or not doing anything, that's of course no reason to be an author. And you might wonder, you know, how do we decide now the order? Um, and I think what I think the key thing is that you look at who should be on it, who did the most work, who brought the paper to publication ready, who wrote the manuscript. Based on these factors and maybe this table that helps a little bit, you sort of sort the authorships. And there are good ways to also solve disputes. Like for example, you know, if two people did pretty much the same, you can just say, okay, we do a dual first authorship. So both are have sort of their contributed equally signs there. And you either do it alphabetically, or if one person does a little bit more, um, then he's first, and the second, the co-first author is on the second place. All right, good. So I think what we should avoid is, um, or should not do, all those guest authors. If those are those that don't meet the criteria, and they're there because they're just, you know, a senior person that should be on there or has some influence on and knows the nature people, I think that is not good, good, good practice. Also gift authors, 
uh, that don't meet the criteria and that just, you know, gave money or or some favors, I think that's not good practice and we should not do that. And of course, we have to think of the ghost authors. Uh, those are who meet the criteria but are not listed. You know, I mean, we have four type criteria we talked about, you know, it, uh, that is not fair and shouldn't be done. Good. If we have the time, I'm going to quickly talk about how, for example, the NIH solves if people don't agree with authorships. And this happens, um, you know, everybody has their own viewpoint, and I think talking is the most important. So the first one is uh, direct di dialogue. So you sit down with the others and you talk and provide your arguments and try to find a resolution that allows you to, you know, be happy with everybody with the positions. And then if that doesn't work, it goes down the road and that's pretty much escalation. So some of you might know that from escalation uh, processes. The next step, if you if that doesn't work, mediation. So you need a third party ombudsman that's neutral and you basically, you know, he brings the perspectives from both parties together and then still the authors can decide and hopefully that works. If not at the NIH, they build a panel of three experts from the field, uh, the NIH scientists that have no conflict of interest. And at that point, the authors lose the decision power. Um, that panel decides who is author and which position. And then if the authors don't even want that, um, the NIH director steps in um, and, you know, takes a publication handles it with the editor and decides the authorship and so forth. But to keep in mind, I mean, you are in research on the long game, you're gonna meet people more than once. So, you know, try to be fair and, and uh, honest. Um, okay, so the take home message from the second part, uh, look at the criteria and assess if you should be an author, right? Um, if not, you know, don't try to stake your claims. It's, you know, there's always a fine line, and I, I know that you know it, it's really hard to sometimes to judge it who should be on or not. But you know, try to be fair. Um, also, that you're responsible for the accuracy and integrity. Also, as a co-author, it's not like you get slapped on a paper and you know it's a check mark on your CV, but it has nothing to do with you. Also, acknowledge the contribution of others decide whether it's a co-authorship or just an acknowledgement based on also the table we looked at before, you know, and solve disputes in a productive manner that counts for everything in life, try to, you know, make the best out of it and, uh, you know, be kind and not greedy. I think that's important. Otherwise it's really hard to come to a conclusion. And I want to thank you guys. I'm happy to take any questions.